Also Programm ist gespickt. Wir starten hier mit unserer Keynote-Speakerin. Sie ist Autorin, sie ist Entrepreneurin und sie ist KI-Expertin bei uns. Ist mit großem Applaus Nina Schick. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here because as you can probably tell from my name, Nina Schick, uh, I'm half German. It's the most German name ever. And of course, I also have a special connection to Berlin. I have a little flat here in the historic words of JFK, Ich bin ein Berliner. But anyway, I'm here to talk to you about something that is so pertinent to the future of work, but not only to the future of work. I really conceive of this as almost a tipping point in human evolution. And that's because I think we are at the cusp of a new dawn where our relationship with machines is going to transform what it means to work, what it means to be creative, and even what it means to experience you know, being alive. So I call this kind of tipping point the era of generative AI, and we are going to be looking at how this might be impacting the future of work. Now, it seems that the soundtrack of our minds for the last few months has been something like this. AI, 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 generative AI, generative AI, generative AI, AI as AI, 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 it uses AI to bring AI, 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 AI. That's the end of my speech, thank you. <laughs> Not quite. But this, of course, AI has been in our lives for a long time, but there's this new phrase being bandied about generative AI. Just by show of hands, Who's heard of generative AI? OK, yeah, as I would expect with this crowd. But what is it anyway? So generative AI, you can broadly conceive of it as a new type of AI. It's kind of less than 10 years old and has only been made possible thanks to advances in AI research and deep learning over the past decade. And the reason why it's different from traditional or so-called discriminatory AI is because it moves beyond kind of labeling or categorizing data, right? Generative AI, the clue is in the name, generative AI is able to generate or create new data based on its training data. Now, I've kind of been tracking what has been now coined generative AI for the kind of last five, six years. But it was only last year that this phrase was really coined, and 2022 was kind of the breakthrough year for generative AI. Why? In part because we saw the rise of these so-called foundational models, which can generate data or create. And we've seen some of these huge models come to the fore that are trained on vast, vast, vast data sets. You can almost conceive of it as being trained on the entirety of the internet. And it turns out that when you train a model on this much data, it becomes general purpose. It's not task specific. It can do a variety of general purpose things. And because these models have NLP built into them, the kind of human interface for interacting with these models is via prompts. So I'm sure you guys have heard of or interacted with some of these foundational models that have come out, again, over the course of the past 12 months. OpenAI's DALI 2, Midjourney, or Stable Diffusion. Now, all of these are foundational models to generate images. Right? And the way that you interact with these models is by prompting them, and then they create. So let's have a look. So this is one of the first kind of foundational models. It's just over a year old from OpenAI, and it's called DALI2. So this is my prompt, which I just made, uh, you know, given that we're in Berlin. A photograph of Berlin, hyper-realistic, the TV tower, and bang. Dali 2 can produce that for me within seconds. Now, all of you have already seen this capability over the past few months. But when this came out in March last year, 
it was really, really groundbreaking. And of course, you can just change the prompt, a highly detailed oil painting of Berlin, the TV tower in the style of Van Gogh. And there you go. Your imagination, your creativity is the only limit to using these kind of foundational models as a co-pilot. But when we talk about generative AI, even though for the kind of past 12 months, a lot of the initial discussion was around these image generation models, like Midjourney or Dolly 2 or Stability AI, there's absolutely no way we can discuss generative AI without talking about large language models, right? And the most famous application of large language models to date, which has completely transformed the entire AI ecosystem and the public awareness of AI being, you know it, chat GPT. Now, I just want to point out how quickly this revolution is accelerating, right? So the foundational models, if last year was kind of the big breakout year for foundational models, you know, it's just been over a year since Dolly 2 came out. ChatGPT is just about six months old. And in the six months since ChatGPT came out, the world has become a very different place. Just to quantify how seismic this has been, let's have a look at this chart, right? So ChatGPT is the most popular application ever. It took Netflix three and a half years to reach a million users. It took Twitter two years to reach a million users. Facebook, 10 months. ChatGPT, five days. Five days to a million users. And I made a prediction, having been following generative AI, like I said, for five or six years, that by 2023, this year, we would start seeing hundreds of millions of people interfacing with generative AI, right? These models that can create and be applied to kind of almost any category of human creative or intelligent output. Now, some people poo-pooed me for that prediction, but that came through true through chat GPT alone because it reached 100 million users in 60 days, right? Two months. Now that, again, makes it the most popular application we've ever known. The next closest thing is TikTok. And it even took TikTok 10 months to get 100 million users. So the head of AI at Meta, Jan LeCun, when ChatGPT came out, he made this comment that, oh, OK, well, it's not that innovative. And he got ragged for that comment, including by me. Uh, but the reason why he kind of missed the point is that it was OpenAI that first put out this interface, this generative AI interface, that hundreds of millions of people started to interact with. And since then, in the past six months, and the reason I'm laying the groundwork here is because it's fundamental to understanding how the ecosystem is shifting and how the market is moving. You have seen all of big tech strategically reorient towards generative AI to make it a core part of their strategy. Microsoft was straight out of the bat. They were first. They really saw what was happening. They already had a $1 billion investment in OpenAI. And soon after ChatGPT came out, they did an additional $10 billion investment. ChatGPT was integrated into Bing. An OpenAI suite of generative tools has been, is being integrated into Microsoft's operating system, right? Still the most popular operating system in the world. Google, seeing this, announced their famous kind of code red, and they quickly invested hundreds of millions of dollars into Anthropic to kind of be a contender to chat GPT, and Amazon is not being left behind. AWS has partnered up with a very famous open source community to provide compute to build new generative models. Meta is releasing foundational models, and they're releasing them open source in the view that if they release these open source, they're going to be integrated into the ecosystem, and therefore Meta believes that some of their models may be more impactful long term. 
Apple, even though they aren't using the words AI, if you look at some of their new products, including their headset and some of the new updates to their software, it's all driven by generative AI. So you've seen this very fundamental shift in what big tech is doing. Uh, I would say unprecedented over the past six months. But similarly, you're starting to see the democratization of this technology through open source. It isn't only big tech who has a monopoly on this amazing new ability of AI to generate or create data, which can be applied, like I said, to almost any human creative or intelligent endeavor. Because now we're understanding that these models, these foundational models, which are so big and so expensive to train, that when it comes to use cases in enterprise, bigger is not always better. You want to iterate quickly off a base foundational model and use a smaller kind of model that's got your own proprietary data. There was even a leaked Google memo a few months ago in which a research engineer said, hey, while we've been kind of worried about Microsoft and OpenAI, it's really open source that we need to be looking at because it's open source that's innovating and iterating quicker, and open source is coming for our lunch. So the AI arms race is on, and it's been on, I think, since ChatGPT came out at the end of November last year. And when it comes to future work, these are three key trends that are absolutely going to define and alter the way that we think about work. The first is that these tools and capabilities are being democratized, right? Hundreds of millions of people already have access to generative models, including through open source. And I think that by the end of the year, you're probably looking at billions of people. The adoption is accelerating faster than probably, in my view, any kind of tech revolution we've seen in the past, and in part because there is so much utility when it comes to business and enterprise. So in my view, there's no doubt it's bigger than the industrial revolution, and you also see an acceleration of the technology, the capabilities of what's possible. So when I first started researching this, the kind of consistent reflection from people in the AI community is that, hey, we didn't think we would be here by now, right? Every day there's a new paper coming out. Every day there's a new development. And every day the capabilities of generative AI keep improving. So I think, again, by the end of the year, what's possible with AI as a tool of augmentation is going to be beyond kind of the realms of what we even dare to dream about five years ago. Again, in part, you have to conceive of this revolution for future work because of the sheer utility of using AI kind of as your co-pilot to augment human activity. Initially, when we started playing with tools like DALI or image generation tools, or people started seeing that AI could be used to generate data or content, it was conceived of as a kind of cool creative tool, right? But what's already becoming abundantly clear is that this is not just a vehicle for creation. This is also a vehicle for instruction, for efficiency and automation, for entertainment, and for insight, for knowledge generation. This is why if you look at the kind of ecosystem, now, I advise startups in the space, Right? One of my startups just became a unicorn last week, so that's really exciting. They were founded in 2017. And they were one of the only generative AI startups well ahead of their time. But over the past 12 months, and this infographic is already out of date, by the way, these are the number of companies you see in the ecosystem. The ecosystem is absolutely exploding. And because it can be applied to so many different areas, right? Companies that are looking at text generation, at image generation, at audio generation, at code generation, chatbots, video, machine learning platforms, search, gaming, and data. 
So no wonder then, according to kind of some preliminary estimates, this entire space, the generative AI space, is estimated to be worth $200 billion by 2030. Now, I think that's actually a very conservative estimate, because if you think about the sheer number of applications and the sheer utility across every industry and in every realm of human knowledge work, I think is going to be worth a lot more than that. Because really, when you start thinking about generative AI, the best way, I think, to conceive of it is that it's almost like a combustion engine for all human creative and intelligent output. In my view, if you consider the information revolutions of the past 30 years, the internet, mobile, and cloud, I think that this has the potential to be bigger than any of them, and in part because the actual physical infrastructure and digital infrastructure for this to be deployed seamlessly is already in place. So when you start thinking about the future of work, right? if we now have this capability for AI to basically be a co-pilot in almost every intelligent and creative endeavor, in all kind of human knowledge work, which traditionally we've couched as, oh, you know, this is the last bastion of kind of where machines can't, uh, can't replace us, although I would, I would argue that it's uh, augmentation rather than automation, it's difficult to quantify, but already we are starting to get some indications. So a study from OpenAI and UPenn, which came out earlier this year, suggested that 80% of the US workforce could be affected by large language models, right? And large language models are only one type of generative AI. It's a type of AI generation vehicle that can work with text. Goldman Sachs also put out a report earlier this year, in March, suggesting that two-thirds of, two of occupations could be partially automated by AI, and it suggested that 300 million jobs could be lost or replaced due to generative AI. Now, when we see these kind of headline figures, it can sound kind of scary, but the same report also suggested that we could see an add to the economy by 2030 of $7 trillion. And the historical trend has always been that as technology automates or replaces certain parts of jobs, new jobs are created. And I think that's absolutely going to be true with generative AI. But of course, the new and distinguishing factor here is that this applies to knowledge work, right? I am um, married to a lawyer. My dad is a lawyer, and it's really interesting, for instance, to think about how generative AI will impact even a field like law, which is so heavily dependent on knowledge work. There are going to be immense productivity gains. So I was at the launch of a report by McKinsey uh, last week where they try to quantify, you know, how is this going to boost productivity, and what's the value add going to be to the economy? And they came up with the amount of annual, annual value that generative AI could add to the economy, just across 63 productivity use cases, up to $4.4 trillion annually. Now, that is more than the entire GDP of the UK. Admittedly, our economy isn't doing too well since the dreaded B word happened, Brexit. Uh, but there will be tremendous abundance, tremendous economic value delivered by generative AI, which is so interesting to consider in the context of the demographic decline of Europe, right? We have an aging population, we have a declining birth rate. Where is the productivity going to come from? AI is going to be one of the bastions of that. No wonder, then, that you are starting to see such a shift in the AI investment landscape. By 2021, AI investment was already sky high, right? It was up to almost 70 
$7 trillion. Here you can see, if you want to compare where in the world has been investing most heavily in the AI, no surprise, the US absolutely dominates, followed by China. And then you can see a kind of little the rest of the world where <laughs> Europe is in there too. But since 2021, when these new kind of generative capabilities started coming to the fore, that investment has skyrocketed. You see 94 billion since 2021, according to Stanford's latest AI index report. So the entire ecosystem is exploding because of the enterprise utility. It's being democratized in part due to open source and big tech's pivot is actually a market moving force. So it is here and it is here to stay. Now, when you conceive of a revolution this big, I actually used to work in geopolitics. So I used to advise global leaders, including the former NATO Secretary General and US VP at the time, Joe Biden. And I became interested in technology because of its potential to shape society. That I think that technology is one of the biggest kind of geopolitical forces at work today. And already there's an understanding on the geopolitical level that we cannot be afford to be kind of left behind when it comes to innovation and a pace of change that is this quickly. So who's doing the best if you kind of look at the leaderboard? Okay, there's no doubt that the US is at the top in part because of its unique ecosystem, startups, venture capital, amazing talent pools, and lots of research. China is probably second because they have good infrastructure and this very ambitious government strategy, but they lack on talent. And then I would say that probably the UK, which again has not been having a very good time since the dreaded B word happened, when it comes to AI is kind of punching above its weight because it has really good talent, a kind of interesting and vibrant AI startup ecosystem, and a lot of good research. Which is why you see the British government kind of desperate to get some growth into the economy, try and position itself as an AI leader. So Rishi Sunak, our prime minister, uh, recently just fired all his AI advisors because none of them saw this kind of generative wave coming. None of them predicted the impact of large language models. He's kind of put new kind of tech entrepreneurs as his advisors, and the British government has announced 100 million pounds as a task force for, uh, for funding foundational models. Japan is doing much the same. Japan supports the industrial use of generative AI, the PM says, so there's already this kind of global competition between nation states to be leaders in AI outside of the US. When it comes to Europe, there's no doubt that France is probably the leader, in part because of the research community and a very vibrant open source community centered around Hugging Face. Hugging Face is one of the biggest kind of open source communities around generative AI. It's, it's a uh, French initiative. But of course, what the EU has already been doing is um, formulating the AI Act, right? So the kind of regulatory part, that's where Europe has been leading. Now, the EU's AI Act is this gargantuan piece of legislation which has been crafted for many years. And until ChatGPT came out, there was no mention of generative AI in the EU's AI Act. But they couldn't ignore the significance of something like ChatGPT, so they've been redrafting the legislation. The legislation has just kind of passed through the first hurdles of being approved by the European Parliament. And already in there, there is provision that anybody building foundational models has to comply and dis show that they've identified and mitigated risks in a number of areas, including rule of law, democracy, environment. So the kind of prevalent sense in the air right now is that the EU is going to regulate and regulate heavily. And like Macron said at VivaTech in Paris last week, the worst combination would be if the EU just focuses on regulation 
and fails to invest or focus on talent and innovation, right? Of course, there is room for regulation, but you need to have the flip side of the coin as well, which is why Mr. Macron, who I actually have worked with in the past, I worked on his electoral campaign in 2017, he's pushing hard to kind of make France a leader in AI, and France actually has attracted a lot of foreign investment, and he announced, so the UK has a hundred million pound fund for generative AI. He announced last week that Fr France would be putting 500 million euros to create a fund for AI champions. Now, a lot of the debate around AI, you see this now, this is the predominant media narrative, right? Is that we've reached this existential risk point where the machines are taking over, it's smarter than humans, and it's going to kill us all. You can't kind of go a day or a week without some new letter coming out warning about the existential risks about artificial intelligence, including this one, uh, which was in March, signed by luminaries, including Elon Musk and Steve Wozniak, calling for a six-month moratorium on the development of AI. Now, really interesting that just as soon as Elon Musk signed that letter, he was buying as many GPUs as he could get his hands on. Harder to find than drugs, he says. And then launching his own version of ChatGPT. So I'll let you draw your own conclusions as to why he was calling for a moratorium. The reason I bring this up is because even though this existential risk scenario is hypothetically possible and therefore should be engaged with, it is so far from what is happening on the ground today. When you consider the sheer utility, the abundance, and the fact that, in my view, these machines are absolutely not sentient, nor are they autonomous agents, please take these kind of warnings which are being hammered down on us on a daily basis with a pinch of salt. So, very concretely then, if you are trying to get ahead of this, either as an individual or as a company, don't underestimate the pace and scale of change. In my view, like I said, this is a tipping point for human evolution. It is utterly profound. Having said that, don't be afraid. This isn't a bad thing, necessarily. It is absolutely in our hands to decide how this technology is rolled out in society. So don't underestimate your own agency. Right? These aren't autonomous agents. We get to decide how AI is integrated into the society and how it will benefit all of humanity. Do prepare, prepare, prepare. Lean into the technology, embrace it. It is here now. If you fail to do so, you will not be able to compete with other individuals, other companies, other nation states who have harnessed the power of AI to be kind of their most powerful kind of autopilots or augmentation you can imagine, do upskill your labor force. There is a huge, huge dearth of talent. AI and coding, in my view, should be on every educational curriculum. And of course, there are profound questions here about how we reimagine education and training, given that AI is going to be deployed as this almost seismic force for knowledge work. Now, just to end, uh, one of the key questions is going to be this, right? Is AI going to augment or automate me? So this is going to become intensely political. Watch this space, right? This is going to become the political issue of the day over the next weeks, months, and years. And there was a very interesting clip which recently emerged with Steve Jobs, obviously the Apple luminary, and the podcaster Joe Rogan where they were discussing exactly this. So let's have a listen. It will be interesting to see what happens when you have computers that are as smart as people, but much more reliable. They won't get tired, they won't get sick, they won't go on vacation and leave work unfinished. You tell them to do something, they'll just do it. And they will have many more orders of intelligence than people have. The computer will be a thousand times more important than it is today. We're right on the edge of that. So what do we want to do about it? Do we want to just ride the wave or do something else? It kind of scares me, to be honest. It should scare you. But it is also really cool. 
That's the best way I can describe it. It's really, really cool. That's the good news and the bad news. It's both. Yeah. That's how most of life is, though. If it was just awesome, it wouldn't be balanced by something else. So it's really, really scary because there's going to be a lot of disruption and change, but it is absolutely really, really cool as well. And of course, in the plot twist that nobody saw coming, that is an entirely AI-generated conversation. That never happened. Final point. I already mentioned that my background is in geopolitics, where I've worked with kind of global leaders on big macro geopolitical trends. And I pivoted to AI five or six years ago, because to me, this was the defining trend uh, when it comes to our generation and how we think about the frameworks of our society. Ultimately, to me, this is not a story about technology, although, yes, we are dealing with exponential technology. This is a story about humanity because of the impact this technology will have on all knowledge work and, indeed, the very framework of our society. The key takeaway here that I want you to leave this room with is that you absolutely have agency. We have agency. We get to decide how we want to integrate these exponential technologies into society. So don't feel afraid or that we're powerless. We have the chance to decide, and we shouldn't squander that opportunity. Thank you.